Good morning, everybody. What a great day it is, amen? Another Lord's Day, another day to come and worship the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Thank you for being here. What an encouragement you are to me. I see we've got some guests, and we are so thankful that you are here. I hope to get to meet you and hug your neck. I am a hugger, and I love it, so just be prepared. I'm not a holy kisser, though, so. <laughs> yes, that one felt good, baby. Mark, we went to the seminar yesterday, and I got a few pointers, so kind of helped me out a little bit. That one was just right in, the, in smooth, though. That one worked out great. We are continuing the series in 1 John, and we come to 1 John chapter 2, verses 15 and 17. And I want to read it and then <clears throat> kind of get into the lesson. Excuse me. <clears throat> the Bible says, 1 John chapter 2, verses 15 through 17. Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world is passing away, and the lust of it. But he who does the will of God abides forever." The first thing that I want us to just start off thinking about is what John says at the very beginning of verse 15. He says, do not love the world or the things in the world. Do we appreciate the importance of that command? Do not. What comes to mind when you think of those words? You know, you ever seen a sign like this? Do not enter. Do you enter? It says do not enter. What about this one? Do not touch. It's out of order. Don't touch it. What about this one? Do not use this equipment. There's a warning. This is not in runnable shape. Do not use this equipment. What about this one? Do not disturb. This means you. When we see those signs, what do we think? We understand the concept of don't do this. Don't be around this. Don't touch this. What about when parents say, I don't want you out past whatever time? Do they mean it? Or are they just saying that? What about, I don't really want you hanging over there with those guys. Or what about, I don't want you talking like that anymore. It's very disrespectful. We understand what the command is, but what is the temptation? After someone hears that from their parents or they see those signs on the wall, what do we do? We go touch it, don't we? Oh, let me see what that thing is. Let me look in there for a minute. Maybe I can fix that thing, right? I'm the one that can fix it. We know what the right thing to do is, but we choose to do what we think is right or what we think is fun. John, through inspiration, tells us something to stay away from. And as we go through this lesson, ask yourself this question, are we? Are we? John says, do not love the world. Well, what world is he talking about? Is he talking about the physical world? You know, in Genesis chapter 1, the one that God created you know, when, on the sixth day, when God saw everything that he had made, and indeed, what did he think? It was very good. So the evening and the morning were the sixth day. Was it that world? No. What about the human world? All of us as humans. 
You remember what John 3.16 says, a scripture that we all know and probably can quote. God so loved what? The world that he gave his only begotten son. No, God loves us. God loves humanity. God uh, was very pleased with the world that he created. No, what he wants to talk about and what he wants us to understand this morning is the world of sin. You know, the one that you've been delivered from, Colossians 1.13, Christian, he has delivered us from the power of darkness, and he's conveyed us into the kingdom of the son of his love. Now, I want to talk about for a minute the kingdom of darkness. Those who are against, those who oppose God Almighty. Paul says it like this in Romans chapter 12, verse 2. He says, be not conformed to the world. And later on, and we'll look at this a little bit more in depth in 1 John, but in chapter 5, verse 19, there's somebody who leads this world. John says, the whole world lies under the sway of the wicked one. Brethren, I'm going to say this morning, and we talked about it yesterday at the seminar, Satan is on the attack. Satan doesn't like you. Satan could care less about you. But what he hates even more than anything is that you love and you serve God. So what is he going to do? Anything possible to bring you away from that relationship. Are you ready for it? Are you ready? Can you beat him? Absolutely. You remember what we studied last week. Do you still remember it as you wake up in the morning? Look with me at verse 14 in chapter 2 of 1 John. I have written you to you fathers because you have known him who is from the beginning. I have written to you young men because you are strong and the word of God abides in you and you have overcome the wicked one. He ain't got nothing on us. If we follow the leader... Y'all ever played that game when you was kids? If we follow the leader, we will have success. But Satan's got some tools now. I want to talk about three of those tools. Three avenues of temptation that Satan uses to get us. And I want to talk a little bit about the garden. But I want us to think about this as we begin. I want us to think about what's the attraction to the world, to this world of sin, this one that we've been delivered from. Is it the lust of the flesh? Look with me at this verse up on these verses on the board with me. Now, Matt, these are the works of the flesh, absolutely. And I want you to read and just think about these things. Now, the works of the flesh are evident, which are adultery, fornication, uncleanliness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies, Envy, murderers, drunkenness, revelries, and the like. Of which I tell you beforehand, Paul says, just as I also told you in time past, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Brethren, if you look at this list, where are you at? You talk about some weapons that Satan is about to present in front of you. Are right here. Oh, you deserve this. I mean, you're jealous and you got the right to be jealous. You should go for you. Yes, you should be selfish in the way that you live. Ain't nobody care about you. You do you. Yeah, you need to go over there and talk to them. You need to go over there and talk to them about that and you need to tell them exactly how you feel. Yeah, look at that lady. It doesn't matter if you're married. Look at that guy. He 
your wife will never know. Hey, one time on a date with your boyfriend or girlfriend, it's okay. You guys can have sex. It's all right. Nobody will even know. Satan uses these things in our lives all the time. In Genesis chapter 3, you remember at the very beginning, turn with me there. Let's look at this briefly. The lust of the flesh. Genesis chapter 3. Chapter 1, I mean, verse 1, the Bible says, Now the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Has God indeed said, You shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat uh, the fruit of the tree of the garden, but of the tree of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, You shall not eat it, nor shall you touch it, lest you die. Then the serpent said to the woman, You surely will not die? For God knows that in the day that you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Satan presents the situation. Doesn't that happen in our lives, brethren? When we think about these lusts of the flesh, they're both sexual and they're both directed towards others. What happens to Eve in verse 6? So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, it got her attention, didn't it? When you owe somebody something, when you need to tell somebody something, when you look at that and figure out, you know what, I can get away with this. How do we react? Do we remember what the Bible tells us and the verse that we just read? It says, do not love the world or the things in it. Or did we already forget that verse? Did that verse already go out the door when that uh, uh, situation gets put in front of us? Boy, isn't it hard? Be real with yourself. Just think about those situations that you deal with in life. Don't you face them day to day, moment to moment? Do you remember and hide God's word in your heart? Do you keep it at the forefront of your mind? So then when the situation comes, you say, you know what? (laughs) Oh, wicked one, you ain't getting me today. Mm -mm. I'm not biting on that. But what does he do so smooth and so cunning? He presents presents it in such a way that it makes sense. What does he tell them? For God knows that in the day you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you'll be like God. That's why he don't want you to eat of it. He don't want you to be like him. Hmm. You might be right. You might be right. What about the lust of the eyes for a minute? Let's think about that. Proverbs 6, 25 says, Do not lust after her beauty in your heart, nor let her allure you with her eyelids. The Hebrew word for eyelids right there is eyelashes. You know, the blinks, the cute looks, the smiles. Do not lust after her beauty in your heart. Man, that is a good-looking lady. Man, that is a handsome man. Do I take it further? Do I go further in my mind? Do I start thinking about the situations that maybe I could work on to maybe get to where it would just be me and her alone or or her and, and him alone? What does Jesus say? We know this one, but I say to you that whoever looks at a woman to lust for her has already committed adultery with her in his heart. What does Satan have at his disposal? He's got some powerful tools. (laughs) If you think he ain't got no tools, you are fooled. Satan been playing this game for a long time, and brethren, if you try to beat him, you will fail. But we got a king. We got a guy who created him. We follow and serve the one 
who Satan can't even touch. Who Satan can't even hold nothing to. But what does Satan do? He puts it in our face. He blinds us so we can't see the Lord. And what we do in our lives is we fix it and we do it our way. These lusts of the flesh come in and we start justifying in our mind. We start seeing it and we see the reality of how it probably could work out. And then we go for it and lose all sight of what the Lord said. John, under inspiration from the Holy Spirit, said, Do not love the world or the things in it. Turn with me, if you will, to Matthew Keep your hands here. I, got a, I, I know you got like five. Put the pinky in Genesis and go with me to Matthew and keep your thumb in 1 John, okay? <clears throat> We're going to do some stretches this morning. We're stretching out. We're stretching our fingers out. Isn't it awesome to be in the Bible, though? Isn't it awesome to be in His Word? Matthew chapter 6, I want you to think about verse 22. Look at what the word says. This is Jesus Christ speaking. The lamp of the body is the eye. If therefore your eye is good, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. One way or the other. If therefore the light that is in you is darkness, how great is that darkness? Think about that for a minute. Eve was presented with this situation. She's justifying it in her mind. She uh, sees that it's good for food. And then she sees that it was pleasant to the eyes. She's working through this in her mind, trying to make this wrong right. Don't we do that? Don't we do that? If we know that it's wrong, we stop for a minute and we think about it and we try to work it out and and figure it out some way so we can make it right so we don't feel as guilty. God says, do not fool with it. Shut it down from the very beginning because you're going to make it right in your mind and you're going to sin and it's going to stray you away. I'm trying to help you out. I'm trying to get you there. What about the pride of life? Think about Proverbs 16, 18. I like this proverb. It's so powerful. Pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. You know, in Genesis chapter 3, verse 6, it says, So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was pleasant to the eyes and the tree was desirable to make one wise, what did she do? She took of its fruit and ate. And then she gave it to Adam. I'm like, come on, Adam. Really? And he ate it. He ate it. Pride can come in all types of ways. Your age. Well, I'm way older than them. I know a whole lot more. They can't tell me nothing. With experience. Oh, I've got 17 years experience on that thing. Who's going to tell me anything, right? I know how to work this machine with my eyes closed. Where you come from, that was a big problem in the Bible times, right? The Jews had a tough time accepting that Gentiles or Christianity was the way now. Past accomplishments. Look at what I've done. Look at all these trophies that I got. Look at all the money that I got. Look at all the power that I've got. Look at all the people that are under me that I got control over. Look at all the possessions, these seven cars that I got in the garage. Man, come peep my Lamborghini out, dog. Proverbs 16, 18 says, Pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. Satan will get in your head and he'll do it any way he can. 
to get you where you don't need to be. John says at the beginning of chapter, uh, two, of chapter 2, verse 15, do not love the world or the things in it. Stay away. You know, I think about this too, and, and 1 Timothy chapter 3 is such a great thought on this concept of pride. And I've talked about this before, but when you talk about the qualifications of the elder, one of the reasons why uh, an early Christian is not considered to be an elder is this verse right here. Look at what it says. Not a novice, lest being puffed up with pride, he fall into the same condemnation as the devil. You know, that was the devil's problem. He got too prideful. So he's easily able to help you with that one. But the Bible, in talking about having these leaders, a part of the congregation, to not be a newly, that Greek word novice is a newly planted plant. So why would a newly planted Christian not be able to be an elder? Because they don't have any experience. Could you see it? I obey the gospel, and then the elders come to me and say, Hey, man, uh, we like you so much, we want you to be an elder. You see the danger in that? You see what could happen? Man, they think a lot about me. I mean, I hadn't even been a Christian that long. Let me help them out with some stuff, right? I don't know the word, so how am I going to make my decisions? I'm going to make them based on what I think is right, which is dangerous. Satan will go to any depth to get you. And his tools are ready and he's locked and he's loaded to have you fail. And then laugh all the way. (laughs) Oh, Christians. You think you got it, but you don't. What did he say to Eve? God don't love you. God don't care about you. God don't want you to be like him. So why not go ahead and get it? You're not going to die. Think about this as we get ready to close. Don't be fooled. Turn with me back to John chapter 2. And I want us to just think about these as we dissect this scripture and then the lesson will be yours. Do not love the world because if we love the world, then the love of the Father is not in us. Verse 16 says, all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father. And I want you to to think about this. The love of the world and the love of the Father can exist in the heart at the same time. Oh, I can say that I love God, but if I'm not doing the things that I'm supposed to do, what am I doing? I'm sinning. I'm not listening to him. Oh, I may say that I love him, but what do I really care about? I mean, it goes back to the whole deal. If I really want to show somebody I appreciate him, if my boss at work gives me a raise and I get to go show him how much I appreciate it, what am I going to do? I'm not going to do anything wrong. I'm going to do it right by the book. Matt, how come you're doing this? Because we got to do it by the book, man. I need you to fill this out before you get on there. You see that sign that said, do not enter, and you walked in? You're going to have to fill this form out. I mean, I love you, bro, and me and you have been friends for a long time, but we got to do it according to what the book says. Not because I'm trying to be mean, because I appreciate what the boss did for me, and I'm going to do it to the best of my ability and show him that I appreciate it. Now, brethren... He made him who knew no sin to become sin for us so we could become the righteousness of God. How much does that mean to you? Is that a game changer for you? Does that make you want to strive to live a life that's pleasing to him? Not if you love the world. Not if it becomes top priority in your life. You know, Eve was tempted by Satan. 
And she gave in to those cravings. And she fell into that trap along with Adam. But verse 17 says this, the world and the lusts of it are passing away. You can play that game all you want, but every second that is passing away. And it'll be gone one day. But doing God's will, doing what God has asked you to do, you will abide forever. Now think about this, and I'm not going to go to the scripture, and you can look at it later. I want to look at three things real quick. You want to know how we find out how to be what we need to be? You want to know how we find out how we should be able to beat and combat Satan and his schemes? We follow Jesus. (laughs) Isn't that awesome? You don't follow Matt Miller's plan because, boy, I'll try my best, but I'll leave you off on the ditch, and I apologize. I'll come back later, but I'll leave you. I love you, but I'll leave you. Jesus said, I'll never leave you or forsake you. Now, that's big time. In Matthew chapter 4, Satan comes to Jesus when he's fasted for 40 days. Could you imagine fasting for 40 days, how hungry you'd be? I'd be starving. I mean, I'm starving right now, and I ate something this morning. You know, I've said some jokes about how I like to eat, and ain't nobody got on me yet, and I appreciate that, brethren. I appreciate that because I do like to eat. Luke gets on me a little bit. Isaac does too. Man, you eat a whole bunch, man. Yeah, I do, and I apologize for that, but I like food, man. But in Matthew chapter 4, verse 3, what does Satan do? He comes to him and he says, If you are the Son of God, command that these stones become bread. What does Jesus respond with? It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone. But how? But by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. I'm going to do God's will. And when it's time for me to eat, it's going to be time for me to eat. But until that time, I'm going to follow God because God has got me where I need to be at. God is going to lead me where I need to go. It happens again. In Matthew chapter 4, verse 8, what does Satan do? He takes Jesus up and he shows him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And in Matthew chapter 4, verse 9, he says, All these things I will give you if you fall down and worship me. Could you imagine seeing all the kingdoms in all their glory? Satan said, I'll give them to you, man, if you just worship me right now. What does Jesus respond with? Away with you, Satan, for it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God and him only, shall you serve. I don't serve anybody except the Father. I don't serve anybody except the Lord. Satan, you ain't getting me this time. I will not partake in that lust of the flesh. I will not partake of that lust of the eyes. You will not make me prideful in this situation. I'm going to humble myself and be just like the king. And one more time, Satan comes to him. In Matthew chapter 4, verses 5 and 6, and he says, if you're the son of God, he takes him on the pinnacle of the temple, and he says, if you're the son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, he shall give his angels charge over you. In their hands they shall bear you up, lest you dash. You the man, Jesus. You think they're going to let anything happen to you? Prove it. Jump off of this and watch what happens to you. And Jesus responds with, it is written, you shall not tempt the Lord your God. When we fill our hearts and our minds with following the Lord, we are able to turn our love where it should be. Jesus says this in John 15, 10, and 11. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. You want to know how we keep ourselves from this temptations that Satan throws at us? We remember this right here. We remember the words of our Savior. 
These things I have spoken to you, brethren, that you might have joy. That my joy will remain in you and that your joy may be full. Keep your eyes focused on me. And this is, will be the reality. Then the king will say to those on the right hand, Come, you blessed of my father. Inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. This world is not my home. I'm just a passing through. <laughs> my treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the blue. You believe that, brethren? Are you excited about that time? I want you to just look at this picture. Ephesians chapter 4 verse 13 says, Till we all come to the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God, to a perfect man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. How do you measure up, brethren? How was your week last week? How's your week going to be this week? Look how excited the sister is. Look at how tall he's growing. He's saying, look, daddy, look. Is that our priority? Brethren, I hope it is. I hope you take this message and you run with it and do not love the world or the things in it. Be strong. Be courageous. Be different. Be a Christian. If you're here today and you're struggling, you can come and get prayers. We'll hug on you. We'll love on you. We'll pray for you. We'll study with you. Do whatever you need. I saw some incredible things by the elders last week, and I'm so encouraged by it. And I love them all, and I appreciate them. Pray for them to keep doing what they're doing, to keep striving to be more and more like God's shepherds should be. But maybe you're here today and you're not a Christian. Friend, friend, as Christ was pleading through me, be reconciled to God today. Change your ways. Turn to him. Fix the things that are wrong. Be added to his body he loves you. He cares for you. He died for you. Jesus said, he who believes and is baptized will be saved. Saved forever. If you want to become a Christian, hey, man, come on right now. What a, what a celebration will go on here right now and in heaven. Whatever you need, come right now. Together we stand and sing.